Today I want to continue talking on the Gyoji chapter of the Shobo Genzo. Um, in the Nishijima Shobo Genzo translation, um, well, here on the internet it would be page 195. Um, I have a 139A written on the side, um, or in brackets, there's the number 216, and then it's somewhere between 216 in brackets and 220. Basically, it's where the mondo, the exchange starts between uh, Bodhidharma and the second patriarch. Sorry, 194? Um, 194, and then it's on the next page, 195. Okay. And on the right side, I see a 139A. Yes. Mm, that's uh, where the exchange starts. Okay. Uh, well, in the past, ま、この行事の巻に着いて。え、1242年、道元禅寺が24歳から28歳まで中国に渡って、え、最初は県人寺に戻っ
。で、まあ、都では28から42まで14年間過ごしてますけれども、その後、福井の方に移転します。宇治の高尚寺はそのまま、まあ、残って今も宇治の高尚寺はあるんですけれどもそこに弟子を残しながら大半の弟子は連れて後には永平寺を建てるわけですなぜ都から福井の山に入ったかそれもまあ理由ははっきりしないんですけれどもどうやら天台宗の圧力もあったんじゃないかと。言われていますひょっとして道元禅師が中国から日本に書いた時本人はもう初めて本当の仏法を日本に伝えるという自負心があるわけですからそれが、えー、まあもう少し仏教界に認められるんじゃないかと思ってたかもしれない。建、えー、仁寺を出た時は、まあ、明前禅寺と2人で中国に渡って師匠の明前禅寺はなくなってその骨を持って帰るわけですねお骨を持って帰るわけですけれどもじゃあ今度は建仁寺の住職に任命されるのか副住職に任命されるかというとそうじゃない。で、都からちょっと離れた宇治の高尚寺を建ててても、うんまあ、一部の僧侶たちあの、当時は日本にダルマ宗という宗教団体があったらして、えー、それは農人という、大日農人という、自分で悟りを開いたという人が、まあ、始めた宗教団体だったんですがその中には幸運英城禅寺をはじめ後に道元禅寺の弟子になってた人たちが多く参加していたわけですねところがこの大日尿農人という人が亡くなってからまあ団体もまあ、バラバラになってその多くは道元禅寺の弟子になったんですねですから一部の人たちには道元禅寺は注目されててこの人こそどうやら中国から本物の仏法を持って帰ったらしいとあこの腐った日本の既成仏教ではない本物のまあ、シャクソンから今日まで伝わっているでも残念ながらまだ日本には伝えられてない本物の、まあ、実践と教えを持って書いたのは道元禅寺だと一部の人にはそう思われたけれども大多数の人にはまあおそらく生意気な小僧だと思われてたでしょう,もう道元禅寺まだえー、書いた時は20歳代、えー、30歳代になってても、うん、その頃の仏教界のお偉いさんには認められるどころか圧力,が圧力がかかってたんだろうそのせいは、まあ、ひょっとして道元禅寺にもあったかもしれないあの彼のコミュニケーション能力、えー、というかあの、まあ、学,童学童用人種などを見ていると今までの僧侶はみんなもう、まあ、偽物だったというようなことは書いてある彼らは、まあ、文字活字こそは学んでたし弘法大師や最長さんのような偉い人でも活字は中国から持って書いたけれどもまだ実践本物の実践は伝えてないとそれが自分が初めて、えー、そこまで言うわけですから、まあ、嫌われても無理じゃないしかし道元禅師としては少しがっかりしていたところもあったかもしれない
、せっかく中国まで行って、せっかくでそこで天皇女王に認められて、この禅、混じりっけもない禅。それまでの天台宗のようにたくさんある修行の中の一つその他多数の中の一つの禅じゃなくてただ座る士官多座をせっかく日本で紹介しているのにそれが何を意味しているかということにほとんど誰も気づいていない。で40歳を超えて、まあ、パトロンであった旗の義重の、えーまあ、お国であった福井に越前に今度、まあ、移転することになった道元禅寺としてはまあ多くの迷いがあったと思うなぜならば都にいれば多くの人に声が届く都にいれば影響力はあるかもしれないけれども越前といえば今でも、まあ、この田島もそうだけれども田舎であって、えー、そこはもう自分の話を聞いてくれるようなそこで消防現像のような話をしても随文記に書かれたような話をしてもそれを理解してくれるような人たちが住んでいるとはとても思えない都であればこそ在家にしても僧侶にしても聞いてくれる人がいるかもしれないけれども福井に入って福井の越前のあの山奥に入ってそのままもう死んで終わりかもしれない。そういう思いも道元禅師の中にあったかもしれない。ただ、もう都では14年間やってても手応えがなかったのか。一部の人たちはついてきたけれどもそれ以上やってても認められそうにないそういう感じがあったんでしょうでまあ天台宗からの圧力もあった、えー、都には東福寺とかやがっては南禅寺とか他に新しく禅寺は建てられるけれどもそういうお寺に住職として受け入れられるということもない。どうぞ、あの新しいお寺を建てたからここに来なさいと、えー、権力の方からお声がかかるわけでもない。で、道元禅師の人生の中で、まあ、そもそも自分は何をしようとしているのか、そういうようになって、中国に渡って、そして日本に帰ってきて、日本で何がしたいか、残りの人生を何に使いたいかと、まあ、そういう考える時期であったと思う、42歳の時は。でそこでまず浮かんできたのは、ダルマさんの。例であったと思う、えー、この行事の巻は上と下と2つの部分からできてて下のところはダルマさんの話でそこは一番気合を道元禅師が入れているでどうやら学者さんの話では上があって下が続くという順番で今消防源氏に載っているけれども実は最初に書かれたのは下の方じゃないかと言われている。その後に「情」を書いたと。「情」はお釈迦様、マカカショという順番で、まずインドから
、えー、始まって、えー、でダルマさんを飛び越して中国の僧は何人か扱われているけれども特にこのダルマさんのところに気合が入っているなぜならばダルマさんはインドで、まあ、裕福な生活を送ってたどうやら、まあ、王様の3番目の息子として、えー、何の不自由もない生活を送ってインドで僧侶として修行を積んで学んでそのまま行けばインドでもう、まあ、王家の息子なわけですから、えー、本当にのんびりと。何の不自由もない勉強しながらこの仏道を実践できてたはずです、えー、インドであれば気候も慣れているし食べ物も慣れているところがこのダルマさんが命を懸けて中国まで出発するわけです3年間がかかっていると言われているで中国に着いたらまず皇帝に会うわけですけれどもどうやら皇帝はダルマさんの話がで理解できてないが中国に渡っても何百年経っているけれども伝わったのは経典だけであってダルマさんの実践する禅がまだ伝わってないそしてそれを実際に説いてても理解されない皇帝も理解しなければ仏教界中国のその当時の仏教界もダルマさんのまあ中国に来たその意味に気づいてないで都を離れてダルマは深い、まあ、少林寺の山に入って9年間面壁をするとまあ言われているんですねあの深い山に入って弟子ができるかどうか全くわからない下手したらそのまま死んでしまうむしろインドに帰った方がマシじゃないかとそういう疑問もダルマさんの中にあったかもしれないけれどもそれをしたならば自分が僧侶になった意味がないあの山奥で座禅したら弟子ができるかどうかわからないけれどもダメ元でやってみるしかしょうがないひょっとして1人2人は弟子ができるかもしれない伝わるかもしれないそれにかけてダウマさんがあの少林寺の山に、まあ、入ってたはずだというような話を道元禅師が書くわけですねこの、まあ、ダウマさんの、まあ、実物見実,実物見本だと,と考えて道元禅師もこのまま都に残ってた方が楽だろうし、うん、問題はないんだろうけれどもむしろダルマさんのように越前でただ純粋にこの道を極めた方がああその道が果たして続くかどうかは何の保証もないけれども少なくともそれは仏像に対する法案にもなるダウマさんはそうやってたしでまあ今日のテーマである体操絵か2番目はのそうは腕まで切り落としてしまった深い雪の中で立ちながら腕を切り落とした。それに自分はどうしたら恩返しができるか
都にいればそのうち、交渉時より大きなお寺を世話してもらえるかもしれない。そのうち上がって天台主にも認められるかもしれない。いずれかは出世できるかもしれないとそういう可能性もまだあったんだろうけれどもそれじゃあダルマーさんやニソエカに恩返ししたことにはならないそういう思いがあってまあこの行事の巻が書かれているわけだと思います、uh, First some words about、um, the chapter 行事 Uh, there are several translations of the title itself.、Uh, itself. What does Nishijima say there? Conduct and. Pure conductance? Conduct and observance. Conduct and observance. So he.、Uh, it's, it's two characters. Gyo means practice or.、Um, In this case, would be conduct, and G means to maintain, or what does he say? Observance. Observance. It's a precepts. What? Observance. observance. G, observance. To, well, to, to keep to the precepts also means G, kai, to, to keep or to observe the precepts. But,、uh, well, my interpretation would be to keep Yoji as kind of one thing, and G basically is maintaining the practice. Continuing the practice, continuous practice would also be、uh, one possible translation of Gyoji. Anyway, a Gyoji chapter is written in 1242, and Dogen Zenji was 42 years old.、Um, Dogen became a monk at a very young age, I think when he was 12. And Uh, they say that pretty early on he had doubts about、um, the Tendai teaching.、Uh, Tendai was the Zen or、uh, the Buddhist school in which he ordained.、Uh, the Tendai teaching is basically that we are all Buddhas already. And Dogen said, if that's the case, why do we practice? If that's the case, why do we ordain as monks,、uh, shave our heads, and practice if we are already Buddhas? And they say that nobody could answer that question, so that's why he later joined his teacher Myozen and they both went to China. That was in 20,、uh, 1224, when he was 24 years old. Where, and in China, he finally meets、uh, his teacher Tendo Nyozo and learns about the practice of just sitting. and Dropping off body and mind. And then he returns to Japan at age 28, saying, I don't bring anything back from China. I come back with empty hands. The only thing I learned from my teacher is that my eyes are vertical and my nose is horizontal. I、uh, know the other way around. The nose is vertical and the eyes are horizontal. Um, he says that's the only thing that he learned. At the same time, he claims that he's the first to bring Buddhism to Japan.、Um, at the time of Dogen, it had been 500 years since the Buddhist teachings had been transmitted to Japan, and there have been several influential teachers. Um, in Kyoto, probably the Tendai sect at the time was the strongest, but there also was also the Shingon sect in the south.、Um, so it was a pretty strong claim for Dogen to say, I'm actually the first one to bring Buddhism. And all the others, they brought the sutras, they brought the scriptures, but they didn't really bring the teaching.、Uh, they didn't introduce the practice to Japan. And it could be that because of that claim,、um, Dogen was not so warmly welcomed back in Kyoto when he came back.、Um, if he would have been a little bit more diplomatic, he might have been a big star because at the time only very few people had the opportunity go to go to China. It was, I don't know, 
only one, two or three guys amongst maybe per year that, that have the opportunity. Um, in some years, there were no ships at all. So uh, he would have been a star if he would have been a little bit more skillful in dealing with the Buddhist establishment. Basically what he said that none of you guys there understand what Buddhism is. It's, I'm the first one. I'm the first one to bring it back. Um, so it's no small wonder when he went back to his original temple, Kenjinji, um, that, well, nobody really appreciated him there. And after a short while, he built a hermitage in Fukaksa, south of Kyoto, and then uh, after turning 30, he started his own monastery in Uji, south of Kyoto, called Koshoji. That monastery still exists today, but then uh, after he turned 40, I think that's the time when plans began to ma be made of moving the whole Sangha out of the capital and into the mountains of what is today Fukui Prefecture, at the time it was called Echise. And uh, later, that's where Dogen built Eheji, which is now one of the two main temples of Sotoshu. And I could imagine that at the time uh, when he wrote the Gyoji chapter, when he was 42, um, he was a little bit maybe struggling with himself because um, two, even today, Fukui Prefecture is kind of, it's... Uh, countryside, just like the area around Antaiji. So um, if you start to build a temple there in the mountains, the chance that you find people that are really interested in Buddhism, that would be coming to hear a Dharma talk, or that would be interested in the topics that Dogen deals with in the Shobogenzo, is really very low. Even in the capital, obviously, Dogen Zenji had not too many students. Uh, mostly, his students came from a sect called the Dharma Shu, which was something like a new religious movement uh, that started a little bit for Dogen uh, by a guy called Dainichi Nonin, who had obviously attained enlightenment by himself. And he found it the school and had a number of students but after his death uh, quite a good amount of those joined Dogen because they had heard of this guy who had came back uh, from China and he had um, some proof of enlightenment from his uh, Chinese teacher. Uh, so some people looked up to Dogen as someone who obviously aimed at something new. So uh, there was a certain amount of people that were disenchanted with the existing established Japanese Buddhism, but it was only a small number. And I could imagine that Dogen, well, was wondering if I go there to the mountains, uh, in Echizen, even if I take my students here from Koshoji with me, it might be actually, well, the end of the whole Sangha. Sangha might survive for another 30, 40 years, but who's going to find me there in the mountains? Um, I would have it much easier back in the capital. Uh, also easier to get support there, financial support, easier to find listeners, both monks and lay people. I could imagine that Dogen had still a number of relatives also living in the Kyoto area that could support him uh, when he needed it. And in Echizen, well, the patron that supported him the most. He came from that area. So there was uh, support from his patron, but apart from that, there was no guarantee that if he moved there, it 
the whole thing that he started would actually continue. Um, so at that time, probably um, he was reminded of Bodhidharma, who um, we finished with before the summer. Bodhidharma comes at the beginning, at the start of the second part of uh, Gyoshi. There's two parts, the first part and the second part. Bodhidharma comes at the start of the second part and he takes up the most space. So when you read the part on Bodhidharma, you feel that uh, that's where Dogen Zenji um, well, he, he uses both most the most amount of space and, and time but he's also he's kind of heating up or, or you realize well Bodhidharma is the example that's really important to Dogen Zenji and the scholars say that actually uh, it's very likely that Dogen Zenji started to write Yoshi with the second part so the second part was originally the start uh, that's where he started with uh, that's what was important for him. And the first part is something that he added later. Uh, anyway, why was Bodhidharma important for Dogen Zenji? Because according to legend, Bodhidharma was born as a prince uh, in India. His father was a king in India. He was the third son. So uh, he, had a, he had it good in India um, as he was the third son. Also, there was no responsibility. Uh, to take over the kingdom, he, he was free to become a monk. Uh, he probably had support uh, both from the royal household and uh, from the local community. Everybody knew he was a prince who was now studying the Buddhist teaching. He had found uh, Hanyatara, a teacher. And uh, if he had stayed in India, he probably would have been an, had an easy life. Um, being used to the Indian climate, uh, living there would have been well, pretty easy for him. Uh, no worry about food. Um, no worry about finding students there. But at one point he decided to go to China and again according to legend it took him three years to actually get there uh, and it was a risky journey just as when Dogen crossed the sea to uh, reach China. Um, at the time a lot of people died on the trip and Bodhidharma unlike Dogen, didn't go to China because he was looking for the teaching there. He already had found a teacher, he had the teaching. He went there just because he wanted to find somebody to listen to him. Uh, there must be people over there in China looking for the Dharma. And when he arrived in China, they say that at, uh, the first thing he met was the emperor. But uh, the exchange with the emperor was disappointing. The, the emperor asked him, I built all these temples, I ordained all these monks, I financed the translation of lots of sutras. Uh, what virtues do I have accumula accumulated doing all this? And uh, Bodhidharma says, there's no virtue, no virtue, zero. And the emperor was surprised and uh, asked, well, what's the first holy truth of Buddhism? And Bodhidharma famously says it's open and wide, there's nothing holy. And then the emperor asked, who are you to tell me that? Who are you? And Bodhidharma says, I have no idea, I have no clue. And that's how the interview ended with the emperor and Bodhidharma went north to Shaolin to sit in a cave for nine years, they say. And instead of that, Bodhidharma could have stayed in the capital and, and hoped that other people would listen to him or he could have moved back to India where his home was. 
Instead, he went to the mountains, not even knowing if anybody would find him there, not even knowing if that would not be the end of his life and he would be forgotten in history. Nobody would uh, ever hear his name again. That would have been highly possible. But then again, if Bodhidharma would have went back to India, people in India at the time, they knew about Buddhism already, what would his return to India have meant? It would have meant nothing. So Bodhidharma took the chance to just say, I'll go there north into the mountains. And if anybody might be looking for a true teacher, they will find me. Um, so when Dogen was probably thinking about should I stay back in Kyoto or should I move, I could imagine that a Bodhidharma story in the story of the second patriarch finding him finally in Shaolin uh, were encouragement for him, for him personally. And in today's section, he's also uh, talking a lot, a lot about repaying our debts or, or showing gratitude towards the ancestors. So for Dogen, probably the more easy thing, the easier thing would have been to just stay in Kyoto, hoping that finally somebody appreciates uh, his teaching, that finally somebody builds him an even bigger temple like Hoshoji. And um, maybe even the guys the, in the establishment finally say, oh, this Dogen guy, he has actually, what he says makes some sense. <coughs> but if he had done that, that wouldn't have been paying back the debts. Uh, that wouldn't have been showing gratitude towards Bodhidharma. It would have been a compromise. Uh, would, uh, wouldn't have been following the example of what Bodhidharma did or what the second patriarch did. Um, so, so much about the context of today's section. Jamazu yondikimas samju sambyaku lokuju loku peji des iwanami bunko no shobo genzo daichi no naka ni nottemas. Kono Niso eka ga yuki o wakete Dharma san no zazen saleru dokutsu made kuru tokoro made wa kono mae setsumi shite ta to omoimasu. Kondo wa 366 page no sangyo mei desu. Shoso aware mite maitan ni to nanji shitasuku setsu ni ta で、行天何をしに来たんだと。流れ落ちて。ただし願わくは
お願いです。慈悲を持って、観路門を開き、開き、広く軍本をどすべし。軍本というのは、まあ、えー、それほど優れてない主張。まあ、この愚か者の私をのために、慈悲を持って、甘露もについては、水野八百さんは、仏の教えの慈悲の目。まあ、あの真実と方便という言葉はあるけれども、えー、真実をズバリ解いても、理解できない人がいるから、彼らのために、まあ、それこそ慈悲を持って方便を使う。優れてない人のためにも、理解してもらえるように、あの手、この手を使って、その人なりに理解できるような工夫。をまあ、普通は方便をと言うけれども、ここで言われる甘露も,もうそういう意味合いで使われているかもしれない。この私のためにでも、この私にでも分かるように、どうか真理を教えてくださいと。味噌いかが頼んで、格のごとく申すに、そういうふうに言ったら、ダルマさんは、諸祖いわく。諸仏無常の明道は、交互に召喚して、難行、農業す。否認にして、忍なり、兄、聖徳、承知、教心、慢心をもて、心情を願わんとせん。いたずらにゴングなら、ゴングなら。非常にまあ厳しいことを言うわけです。えー、何かというと、もろもろの仏たちがこの上ない言葉で言い尽くせない、考え、思いの及ばないこの道、道。まあ道というより、本来ならば菩提のことですね。この悟り。この悟りのために、交互に召喚して、永遠に長い時間。要するに、この一生だけじゃなくて、何回も生まれ変わって、死に変わって、精進をして、耐え難い修行。に耐えて、忍びがたいものを忍んでいる。どうして徳の少ない、知恵の少ない、心の狭い、俺が俺がという思いをまだ手放せないものに、その心情、真実の乗り物、真実の教えが得られようか。そんなものを勝手に何か欲しい欲しいと言ったってどうするんだ。この時二層聞きていわく。いいよいいよこの時に二祖聞きて、いよいよ、改礼す。この言葉を聞いた二祖は、ようやく、まあ、本気になった。水野八百子さんのこの改礼についての注釈は、教えを聞いて、志を励ます。要するに、ダルマーさんのこの話を聞いて本気になった。密かに離島を取りて、自ら差し
を立ちて、治癒自然するに、諸祖ちなみに二祖、これ、放棄なりと知り。そして、隠れていった、よく切れる刀を取って、自分の左腕を切ってしまった。その腕を師匠の前に出すと、ダルマさんは、あ、この人の、この人は、まあ、ほうきであると、えー。仏法を学ぶ、学ぶ器があるんだと、まあ、ようやくそこで認めたという。Last time、uh, I was talking about、uh, the part until the second patriarch actually reaches the cave of Bodhidharma and he's standing in the deep snow.、Um, where you find the 139a,、um, Dogen Zenji、uh, talks about、uh, the bursting of the gallbladder. So when we imagine the cold、uh, that the sacred patriarch had to endure when he was standing up to his hip in the snow, that would be enough to burst one's gallbladder. The hair on one's flesh simply bristles with cold and fear. And then、uh, starts、uh, the actual conversation between the two. At dawn, the fir first patriarch, so that's Bodhidharma,、uh, took pity on him, that's the second patriarch, Eka. At dawn, the first patriarch took pity on him and asked, What are you after standing there in the snow for such a long time? Questioned thus, his tears of sorrow falling in ever greater profusion. The second patriarch said, Solely I beg, master, that out of compassion you will open the gate of, to nectar and widely save all beings. When Taiso Eka had spoken thus, the first patriarch said, The Buddha's supreme and wondrous state of truth is to persevere for vast kalpas. To become able to practice what is hard to practice and to endure what is beyond endurance. How can one hope to seek the true vehicle with small virtue and small wisdom and with a trivial and conceited mind? It would be futile, toil, and hardship. As he listened, then the second patriarch was by turns edified and encouraged. Secretly, he took a sharp sword and severed his left arm. When he placed it before the master, the first patriarch could then see that the second patriarch was a vessel of the Dharma.、Um, this incident is famously pictured、uh, in a painting by the Japanese artist Seshu. I'll, I'll pass it around, it's here in this book on page. 333. It's, at least in Japan, it's a very famous、uh, painting of、uh, the second patriarch offering his arm to Bodhidharma.、Um, although, I, I mean, it's a small picture, so you can't really see it.、Uh, the faces are. So, Seshu obviously he used a lot of, how do you say?、Mm, Detail or concentration on the faces while the rest of the picture is done in rough、uh, strokes. I find the most impressive kind of the wall behind. Whenever I look at this wall, it reminds me of Munch's、uh, painting of the scry. It seems that the wall is actually expressing the feelings of the second patriarch at the time. And Dogen Zenji, in the context,、uh, especially in the part before、uh, this dialogue, he also. Tries to convey the state in which the second patriarch must have been at the time, having studied、uh, not only the Buddhist scriptures but also Confucian and the Taoist scriptures. 
uh, for a long time and still not having found the answer to his questions, uh, there's finally some kind of mystical deity uh, approaching him and telling him to go south. And at that time, uh, he starts to suffer from headaches and he sees his master at the time who's trying to help him with the headaches. But when he looks at the skull, it has the form of a kind of mountain with five peaks. And when uh, the second patriarch tells him about this mysterious voice that had told him to move south, uh, his master tells him, well, then you should try to do that. Uh, that's not a normal headache that you have there. And then he finally finds Bodhidharma sitting in his cave. And when Bodhidharma tells him that um, he will not teach him the Dharma for cheap, he decides to cut off his arm. Eto, Niso Eka ga ude o kitte shimatta. Ato, Dharma san wa yoyaku kare ni ma utsuwa ga aru tiu koto o mitemete iru. Soshite yu. Shobutsu saisho ni do o moto meshi toki. Ho no tame ni katachi o mojiki. Nanji ima hiji o wagamae ni danzu motomuru koto mata ka naru koto ari. Moromoro no hotoke tachi ga chiban saisho ni kono do satori no michi o motometa toki ni ho no tame ni katachi no aru mono. Mizu no Yaoko san wa mi no katachi to kaite iru kero mo, ma jibun no mi dake ja nakute, ma zui monki di iye ba, ma zu yo o ste, iye o ste, mi o ste, kokuro o ste, koyu, watashi tachi wa fudan, jibun no daiji na mono da to motte iru, sezoku teki na chi ya zai san, so shite kazoku, そして自分の身、そして自分の心をも投げ出す。えー、法のためなら、もろもろの仏たちは、それを捨てたのである。法のために、形、形をもうじき。何時、今、肘をわがまえに断ず。お前も、今こうして自分の腕を、でそれを私の前に突き出したのだ。もとむることまたかなることあり。それならば、お前の求めに応じようではないかと。お前にも求めることがありそうだなと。これより同王にいる。そしてそこから、ミソエカが。弟子入りを許されたダルマさんのお堂に入ることを許された終始8年そうした8年間そのもとに使えた勤労千番まことにこれ人間の大エコなるなり人間の大道寺なるなり。核のごときの勤労は採点にも効かず、統治初めてあり。八、えー、年間、ダルマさんに仕えて、その勤労千万、もう計り知れない苦労、これはそれ以前、インドにも中国にも聞くことはなかった、えー、まさに人間の同士であったと大同士であったと、え
、人間にも、天使たちにも、教えることの、まあ、できる、修行者であったと。ハガンはイニシエを聞く、徳髄はソニガクス。かつてマカカショウがお釈迦様が花を持ち上げて微笑んだようにニソエカが今度は中国でダルマさんからその骨髄を得たと言われている静かに乾燥スラスラクは諸祖、幾千万の生来ありとも、二祖、もし行事せずは、今日の方角、素材あるべからず、えー。よくよく考えてみなさいと、道元禅師はここで読者に向かって言うんだけれども、いくらダルマーさんがインドから中国に渡ったことが、大事であるからといってたとえこのダルマさんが千万回インドから中国に渡っていったとしてもそこに二層という人が現れてこなければそしてこの二層が行事してくれなかったら今日の私たちにはそれが伝わらない。今日の私たちが満足にこの文物道修行を学んで実践することはできなかった。ダルマさんも偉いけれども、弟子の二祖も偉い。まあ鎖で言えば、どこの部分を取ったって鎖が切れてしまう。でまあ、ここで行事の巻、どこでもそうですけれども、面白いというか、あのこの行事の巻の直腸の場は、シャクソンとマカカ賞の賞もあるけれども、そこではこのハガのエピソード自体は書いてない。お釈迦様が花を持ち上げて、そこでマカカ賞が微笑んだという、有名な話は行事の巻には書かれてない。マカカあのお釈迦様のとこに何が書いてあったかというと、お大樹の下で、明けの明星を見て、悟ったという、そういう話も書いてない。書かれているのは、悟った後でも、本来ならもう涅槃に入っててもよかったはずなのに、涅槃に入ることなく、一人になることもなく、いつも弟子たちと共に、旅をして質問されたら答えてたという大気説法なさったとそれをもう80のご高齢になるまで釈尊が続けたというその出家だけが強調されるマカカショウの場合も応援だという話ではなくて他の兄弟弟子にお前ちょっと無理しすぎじゃないかと思われるぐらいに厳しい修行をやはりご高齢になるまで続けたという話が書いてある。で、今日の二祖エカのところも、あの有名な安心問答というのがあるけれども、ダルマさんと二祖エカといえば、有名な安心問答が普通、まず本で紹介されるけれども、それも全く触れない。安心問答とは何かというと、肘を切った後に、ダルマさんは君は、じゃあ何が知りたいのかと、何を求めているのかと、ニソエカに聞くと、ニソエカは、長い間、仏教を学んできたけれども、いまだに、私の心は安らぐことはできない。どうか私に安心を与えてください。私の心に安らぎを与えてください。ダルマさんはよかろうという
それならばその安らげない安らぐことのできないお前の心をここに持ってきなさい持ってきたらお前に安心を与えてやろうじゃないかとしばらくしてニソエカは探しても探しても私のこの心をつかむことはできないダルマさんは、そうか。お前のその心を、私はもうすでに安らいでやったのだと。お前にはそうして、もうすでに安心を与えてやったんだと。こういうまあ有名な問答があるんですね。でダルマーさんとニソエカのやり取りといえばまずみんなここだけが知りたいあの瞬間にニソエカに何が伝わったのだろう何が理解されたのかどうしてそこで安心できたのかとその答えは簡単に言えばありのまんまの心今のまんまのえー、たとえ安らぐことのできないこの現実の中においてのこの心心は世界の中の出来事じゃないからこれを全部見渡しているものなのでこの心がそのまま仏なんだということにようやく気づいたいくら海の中に波が荒くて台風が起きようが大あられであろうが海そのものはいつも海そのものこんなに波が高くたって海そのものがそれに動かされること,動かされることがないだから心というものはつかめる自分がつかめるようなものじゃないと気づいた時はこの心というものはそもそも安らぐとか安らがないとかこういう混沌した現実を超えたところにあるそれを全部見渡しているところそれが心ところがそういう話を道元禅師はここであえてしない深い雪の中にじーっと朝になるまでニソエカが立ったとダルマさんが振り向いたと思ってたら仏教とはそう簡単には教えてもらえないぞと吐き捨ててしまいには腕を切ってしまったと。でそこで行事でニソエカの話が終わってしまうんですね。あとはもうあとは8年間実践したと。この安心問答で一発悟ったかのような話が省かれる。この省かれることに意味があると思うんだよね。この安心問答だけを読んでると、まあ腕は。腕を切ったのはすごいけれども、あとは、ダルマさんが、すごい、まあ、器用に、えー、問答を仕掛けたので、ニスエカも、一発で悟っておしまいだ。そうじゃないとその下準備もあったしようやく弟子入りを許されてから8年間勤労千番と過去のごときの勤労は祭典にも聞かず統治し始めてありと言われている波岸はいにしえを聞くこの波岸の聞く
かけとなったのをただその花を持ち上げたんじゃなくてシャクソの40数年の旅とマカカショウの、えー、まあ誰にも負けないズダ業があってからこそ特髄はソニガクソ同じように誰にも真似できない勤労があってこそダルマさんからミソエカへ髄が伝わった静かに乾燥すらくは、諸祖いわく、行く千万の生来ありとも、みそ、もし行事せずは、今日の方角、粗大あるべからず。いくらダルマさんがインドから来たとしても、そこにみそがいなければ、今日の私たちの伝道、修行もなかったはず。今日、我ら、消防を検問する類。となれり、その恩必ず放射すべし。私たちが今日、消防を見聞きできるのは、人へにみそえかのおかげでもある。その恩は必ず放射すべきである。その放射は、予言の方は当たるべからず。当たるべからず信用も不足なるべし、国情も重きにあらず。どうやったら恩返しができるかというと、予言の方、なんかその辺の教えを持って恩返しができるわけではない。信用ですら不足ではあると書いてある。自分の身を投げ出しても、命を投げ出しても、まだ足りない。ましてや国とか、城など、軽いものであると。なぜならば、国情は他人にも奪れる。真摯にも譲る。国であったり、城であったら、他人に奪われることもあるし、親から子に受け継がれて、奪われる、取られてしまうようなもの。信用は無常にも任す。自分の命くらいはどうせ死ねばなくなるもの。大したものではない。主君に,にも任す。それはその時の権力者に奪われてしまう時もある。邪道にも任す。たまには横島な道に落ちる時もある。邪道によって失われる時もある。しかあれば、これを越して放射に義するに不動なるべし。だから、国でも、指導でも、自分の命も、物素型に放射するのに不適切である。では、なぜか、何が適切なのか、どうやって恩返しができるかというと、ただまさに、日々の行事、その放射の衝動なるべし。その日、その日、つまり、今日なら今日。明日は明日。その日の修行をその日のうちに続けてゆく。それが放射の衝動なるべし。えー So the second patriarch cut off his left arm and placed it before Bodhidharma. And so he said, that's Bodhidharma. So he said, when in the beginning the Buddhas pursued the truth, they forgot their own bodies for the sake of the Dharma. Now you have cut off your arm before me. In your pursuit, also, there is something good. 
From this time forward, he entered the master's inner sanctum. He served and attended the master for eight years through thousands, myriads of exertions. Truly, he was a great rock beneath human beings and gods and a great guiding teachers of human beings and gods. Exertion like his was unheard of even in the western heavens. It happened for the first time in the eastern lands. We learn the face breaking into a smile from the ancient saints, but we learn getting the mirror under this patriarch. Let us quietly reflect, no matter how many thousand myriads of first patriarchs had come from the West, if the second patriarch had not maintained the practice, there could be today no satisfaction in learning and no handling of the great matter. Now that we today have become people who see and hear the right Dharma, we should unfailingly repay our debt of gratitude to the Patriarch. Extraneous methods of repayment will not do. Bodies and lives are not sufficient and nations and cities are not important. Nations and cities can be plundered by others and bequeathed to relatives and children. Bodies and lives can be given over to the impermanent. They can be committed to a lord or entrusted to false ways. Therefore, to intend to repay our gratitude through such means is not the way. Simply to maintain the practice day by day. Only this is the right way to repay our gratitude. Um, so after the second patriarch cuts off his arm, the Bodhidharma uh, recognizes him and tells him that he has something to look for uh, as his student. And it's interesting that uh, Dogen, as always during this chapter, seems then to skip the vital part. Um, in the Koan collections, uh, or for example, um, in Soto Shu, there's uh, next to Dogen Zenji, there's Kesam Zenji. Um, and these two in Japan are considered the two patriarchs of Soto Zen in Japan. And Kesam Zenji is uh, famous, among other things, for writing a book which. Uh, is translated into English as the transmission of the land. And in that book, or the transmission of light, sorry. Uh, the transmission of the land is a similar Chinese work. Uh, both the transmission of light by Keizan Zenji and the transmission of the land in China um, explain how enlightenment experience was transmitted from the Buddha to Mahakashapa and from Mahakashapa to Ananda and all the way down uh, to the 28th patriarch in India, which would be Bodhidharma, and then from Bodhidharma to the second patriarch in China, and then down to the sixth, and so forth. And um, later here in the text, um, Dogen Zenji speaks of the breaking of the face, I think. Um, where was that? We learn the face breaking into a smile from the ancient saint. Ancient. So uh, the face breaking into a smile is uh, the story when uh, the Buddha, according to legends, holds up a flower. And among the hundreds and thousands of students of the Buddha, only Maha Kashapa smiles. And at that moment, the Buddha says, here today, I transmit uh, the wondrous Dharma. Uh, the Shobo Genzo, kind of the true uh, Dharma I storage I transmitted to you this moment. Although no words have been exchanged in that moment. Uh, he's holding up a flower and Mahakashapa smiles. And at the beginning of the Gyoji chapter, the first part in the beginning, uh, Dogen Zenji speaks about the Buddha and he also speaks about Mahakashapa. But this episode 
isn't mentioned. Um, also, the famous story of the Buddha sitting under a tree and then seeing the morning star and getting enlightenment in that moment isn't mentioned, but it's rather um, the six years of sitting that led up to that, and then the 40 years uh, that uh, the Buddha spends traveling through India, uh, always being with his students, uh, answering the question of people uh, who ask him something. Then there's uh, about Mahakashapa. Uh, the story is basically that uh, until he's really old, Mahakashapa practiced harder than any of the other Buddhist disciples, and they were kind of laughing that he was doing much too much. But only the Buddha uh, then, in the end, offers him half of his seat and he's kind of moving uh, to one side and uh, tells Mahakashava, please uh, sit next to me. Um, so, with most of the Buddhas and patriarchs that Dogen mentions in the Gyoji chapter, and there's many, he always emphasizes the hardships they go through, and he seems to kind of skip the vital enlightenment experience. And here's the same. So, uh, normally, when people talk about Bodhidharma and the second patriarch and their encounter, um, after cutting off the arm, there's the question of uh, Bodhidharma to his new student, his first students. What, what are you looking for? Why have you come here? And the second patriarch says, uh, I've been trying to pacify my mind for so long, and still I haven't been able to find peace for my mind. Can you please give peace to my mind? And Bodhidharma says, okay, uh, please bring me your mind and I will pacify your mind for you. Just bring it here. And after a while, the second patriarch says, I've been looking for it, but I cannot grasp it. My mind cannot be grasped. And Bodhidharma says, see, Thus, your mind has already found peace. And that story is, is usually famous. That's what uh, you find in lots of books about the transmission of Zen from India to China. Uh, that's how Bodhidharma opened the, eye of, the eyes of his first uh, student. Uh, the mind that you try to pacify, it's actually beyond grasping, it's beyond being at peace or being not at peace. Uh, it's like the ocean that is still the ocean and the waves can be as high as they want. They still will not be able to bring the ocean out of balance. The ocean is always balanced. Even if the, the tide is high, the tide is low, there's a storm, there might be a typhoon. It doesn't move the ocean and that's how our mind is. So even the greatest depression, even the greatest anxiety, the mind is always the mind. The mind is beyond that. And when the second patriarch realized that the mind cannot be grasped, they say, well, he intended enlightenment. But for some reason, Dogen Zenji doesn't even mention that exchange. He's talking at length about the depth of the snow, the cold of the winter, and then uh, the cutting off of the arm. And now he's mentioning the eight years after that. He served and attended the master for eight years through a thousand myriads of exertions. So that's what imp it's important for Dogen at that point. Not about this one-time experience that you might or might not have. And when you have it, it might be wonderful. I sometimes compare it to falling in love. The moment you fall in love, the whole world looks different. It's not the same as yesterday, although nothing has objectively changed. But
the whole world is different. And it's a wonderful experience that all of us have once and maybe several times. But falling in love is not a guarantee for leading a happy marriage. It takes something different to actually live in a relationship over the years. And that's what you usually find emphasized by Dogen, the practice that needs to accompany the experience. Falling in love, yes, great, great. Uh, great thing, wonderful thing, and it changes the world. But what is important is what comes after that, the practice, the expression of love, practice love. Um, also something that I've probably said in the past, what's, what's the difference then between being in love and loving? Um, for me, the difference is that being in love is something that only can know you can know only you know when you're in love and only you experience the change of the world if you fall in love the world changes for you but for nobody else uh, if you told tell your friends that the world is a different world for you now they might say oh that's great for you but for us it's still the same world only new you know um, when you're in love but only the others know when you're loving because love is something that's expressing itself in your attitude in your face in your facial expression in your words and what you do um, sometimes you might not even have the intention that you do something out of love but it still communicates because it expresses in your uh, behavior probably that's when love is strongest when you do something to show your love like here i'm full of love i do that for you i do that for you um, usually this intention this kind of inner oh i'm, I'm doing that out of love usually mm, compromises or kind of dilutes uh, the action it's not true love anymore it doesn't really communicate as true love anymore and uh, the same is true for the relation between enlightenment experiences and practice it's not that enlightened exp enlightenment experience wouldn't exist or that they're not important but they're not worth much if they don't communicate or are not expressed in the practice and in the practice It's not really actually important if you think I'm enlightened, I do this as an expression of enlightenment. If that thought mm, is there, again, it would dilute. Uh, how do you say, is that an English word in the first place? Kind of, you know what I'm trying to say? To, to make something kind of dirty. If you, if you have water and you put something in the water, like that. Like, Contaminate? Contaminate, yeah. Well, that's that's basically what I'm trying to say. Um, only for do, those that, that wonder, if you read this, this chapter, you hear a lot about the different patriarchs and how they studied. But in each case, the vital thing seems to be missing. The vital thing that's usually emphasized uh, in the koans that somebody I don't know slaps another guy in the face and he gets enlightened or cuts off their finger and they get enlightened or shouts and they get enlightened in the Gyoji chapter none of that 
none of that. You only hear about the cold winters that they endured or uh, how they were almost starving and still persevered. And it's because of that, Dogen Zenji says, that today we are able to study. If that wouldn't have happened, we wouldn't be able to study. And we have to, well, repay that. And he says, at the end of today's section, he's asking himself, well, how do you, can you uh, repay that? He says, nations and cities are not enough to repay it because nations and cities can be plundered by others and bequeathed to relatives and children. Even your body and your life would not be enough because it can be given over to the impermanent. What Dogen means in that case you probably means what well, you're going to be dying anyway. So, so even if you give your life away, I mean, that's going to be taken away uh, by death anyway. So that's, even that is not enough. Uh, so what can you do to repay your debt towards the ancestors? And the answer is uh, what shall be the last sentence today. Uh, simply to maintain the practice day by day. To practice two days, practice today, and tomorrow's practice tomorrow. Only this is the right way to repay our gratitude. Simply to maintain the practice day by day. Only this is the right way to repay our gratitude. Okay, um, I thought, I actually thought I would get a little further than this, but we don't have to be in a hurry. I'll stop here today and continue next month. But if you have any questions, as always, uh, feel free to あす。え、本当はもう少しさっきまで進めるんじゃないかと思っていましたが、急ぐ必要がないので、今日はえ、まず Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. No questions? Yes, please. Um, well, Dogen often talks about like deities or demons. Deities or demons? Yes. I keep on reading that in well, 50 chapters. And I'm always wondering what, what is he talking about? Is it like in Theravada where they have like these different realms and Mm -mm. Well, I don't know how Dogen or the people at the time understood it, but I mean, when, for example, in the old sutras, there's a talk about the, the a devil coming, approaching the Buddha, like, uh, what was it, Maya or someone? Not Maya, but the Mara? Mara, Mara. So usually it's translated as the devil, or it could be demons uh, approaching somebody, um, or maybe there's a deity coming. That there, there's a god coming down, and uh, I think it was Brahman who asked the Buddha, "Please don't pass into Nirvana right away, but stay until you die of natural causes, and please preach human beings." Uh, the kind of modern interpretation would be that, well, that's something that's happening in Buddha's mind. Like, at one point, when he was close to enlightenment, that I was the devil telling him, well, why do you do this useless practice? Why don't you go back to your parents, become king anyway? Or there's uh, the devil coming in the form of a woman, say, hey, there, there, there's so many beautiful women in this world. So basically, that's, that's what we experience during the Zen all the time. When, when, when you sit there and ask yourself, well, why am I sitting here and wasting time of my life? Like, some of you will probably 
experiences tomorrow, day after tomorrow, and, and ask yourself, why am I sitting here? I could could have a good time in Osaka, or uh, I could go to Tokyo, I could go back home. Why am I wasting here in, in my time in this wet, cold climate, bearing the pain and looking at the wall? And at that time, the devil is talking to you, obviously not literally, but, but in your mind. That there's something coming in your mind. And sometimes, like, well, all of you probably have a reason why you found Antaj and why you came here, why you had the idea to, you want to come here. But then when, when you really dig to the source, well, what was it finally? And you try to connect all the pieces of the chain that, that brought you to Antaiz, you probably there's, there's some, some open links or, or Well, like for example, in my case, when, when I was 16, it was a complete accident that there was somebody who asked me, why don't you want to start uh, meditation? Why don't you try the Zen? And, and I wasn't convinced, but he told me, well, if you can try it once and then you stop if you don't like it. And then it was, well, better than I expected. And... I stuck with it and later I started to read books and that was enough for me to give me idea oh that's what I wanted to do and then I uh, started to study Japanese at university that's where for the first time I heard about Dogen and in a dojo in Berlin I heard about a teacher in Kyoto so when I studied in Kyoto I went to that teacher and he told me about Antaisi so it was kind of one one accident led to the next, and of course, I, I'm part of that. Of course, I, I mean, I could always have said no. That's not what I do want. I want to do something different with my life. But in a way, you could express that in a in a kind of flowery way. As that there's been deities or, or gods, uh, basically an accident, and or sometimes there's. Also during the Zen, it's not always the devil that's talking to you and, and trying to seduce you. Sometimes when you make a decision, it's almost like that, that there's another voice, kind of heavenly voice also that it's helping you to make up the mind and say, no, I'm staying here, put on the cushion or, or sometimes when a person needs your help sometimes there's the temptation and it's pretty strong to just look the other way and ignore that person and say hey I've, I'm busy now I can't help you but then sometimes something brings you back there and I think basically that's what is meant when in the sutras they talk about deities and and and, and uh, heavenly beings and, and demons and devils and stuff like that. It's basically yeah, the reality that we are confronting. And, and usually in our modern way, we would say, well, the stuff that comes up during the Zen, that's, that's, it comes out of our unconscious or it's old stuff, memories, um, karma, whatever. But uh, yeah. Maybe in the old days, that's what they meant when they say, well, there's a demon that appeared, there's a heavenly being that appeared and said this and that. At least that's how I would make sense of that. Yes, please. Um, I have one. So you made the comparison to I like romantic love mm. and this kind of idea of falling in love mm -mm. and all these great feelings you have to a kind of enlightenment experience mm -mm. and then uh, the actual marriage and the main maintenance of the marriage has been the sort of I guess the practical mm. element of that love so with Zen um, you know I guess people have some sort of experience that makes them want to go to a monastery um, but like 
I guess, how do you always realise that going to the monastery um, is the most sort of practical expression of that experience? Say for Dogen, at his time, <clears throat> it was probably quite impractical for him to decide to go to China because, you know, mm -hmm. maybe there was a boat leaving every decade or, mm -hmm. you know, he could die very easily and the game would be over for him. So maybe not so practical, I guess, for the Seven Patriarch, really thinking, okay, so my way of getting in with bullet armor is to just, yeah, sever my arm off. Mm. So I guess it's, how do you kind of distinguish that point where you make that kind of jump, which is in sort of, I guess, most normal terms, if you'd like to call it, impractical, to something that is a practical expression of your enlightenment experience. Distinction between impractical and practical. Mm. So that to maintenance, so you're talking about expressing love as being sort of, mm -hmm. you know, the feeling of love, but then mm. the, the, the actual practicing of love, which yeah. is, a, a, you know, practice is, I guess, sort of practical, like mm. practically showing your love by maintaining a marriage for the rest of your life, mm. Mm. creating a, a sort of mm. something that works rather than a romantic yeah, idea. Yeah. So it was then, you know, this idea of someone removing their arm or mm. travelling on a boat that leaves every decade, it's, you know, I mean, by normal standards, it's completely impractical. But if it had not ha had happened, yeah. you know, so I guess your mind, or well, at least for me, my mind thinks practically, and then, you know, when, I guess as I practice or study Zen, you know, I have to decide, oh, is this a delu delusion, or is this, you know, just some sort of demon or something talking, saying, oh, you, mm. you know, you, you're going to die, or, uh, you know, these kind of worries. Or, you know, how do you distinguish that practicality? Is that, you know, if you have acquired a certain level, you're able to say, removing my arm right now is actually the thing that I must do to maintain my practice. Hmm. Practical. <laughs> so it's quite a difficult question, I guess, but... Like, I mean, in, in the case of the boat, I mean, I don't see how that wouldn't be practical, especially mm. if you have reason to believe that you can't, can't find a teacher in the country where you are, but you need to take the boat, and, and that's the only way to get to meet a teacher. Mm. In the case of the arm, of course, you could, could argue, was it really necessary to cut off the arm in that instance uh, and uh, maybe Bodhidharma should have reacted a little bit quicker rather than wait uh, for the second patriarch. Um, who knows? I mean, who knows? But. I mean, maybe that's also one reason why Dogen insists that even offering your, your body and life is not enough. Mm. Rather than, like, you could say, well, if the, the second patriarch cut off his arm, then we should cut off all of our limbs, <laughs> and, and that would be repaying the debt. But, but uh, Dogen then says, well, that anybody can do that. Life is going to take away your body from you anyway. So you have to do something different, and that's day-to-day -day practice and I mean one good thing about being part of a practicing community like Antaiji is that there's a schedule we have so if you would be practicing on your own you probably would, would ask yourself well am I maybe doing too much getting up every day at 345 or you ask yourself, well, I can do it 3.45, why don't you get, get up at 2.45, 1.45? And, and uh, you read in the books about these guys who need, never sleep for, slept for three years. So, so if they did that, I should also do it. And in Antaiji, there's, there's a time where you can go to bed. Everybody goes to bed. So um, I wouldn't worry too much about kind of what is 
practical and what is not. I mean, if you follow the schedule at Antas, you do a pretty good amount of time of Zazen during the year. You have enough opportunity to practice from day to day and sometimes maybe even do something that seems to be a little bit impractical or over the top because Ecosan is pushing you or somebody else is pushing you uh, to, to harvest rice in the, in the rain or whatever. But uh, you can still pretty sure this is not going to cost you your life, even, even if it's sometimes feel that way. Like, like I, I love to sto tell the story be before sessions that uh, to me often it felt like I'm going to die on the third day of session. Because, I mean, you got the cushion there, you got the roof over your head, uh, you got two meals a day. So, from an objective point of view, there, there's no way you're going to die in that situation. Why would you want to die? But it feels like that. And, and maybe you all experience that. It's, it's bad enough on the first day, on the second day, it gets worse. And on the third day, you're still in the middle of the session, and the fourth day and fifth day is still ahead. But it feels as if you could seriously be dying. And usually during my first sessions, I would either bite my teeth and somehow try to fight through and count until 100 and hope that the bell rings until then. And if it doesn't, then I figure out maybe I can count until 100 another time, maybe another time. And hopefully, eventually, the bell rings. Or you kind of uh, try to move your, your feet a little bit. Hopefully your neighbors don't, don't recognize why you try to shift a little bit and get away from the pain. Um, but either way, either your, your jaws start to hurt a lot after session. That often happened to me, that after session, the feet were okay after a while, the back was okay, but my, my teeth hurt. And at first I didn't notice, why, why do my teeth hurt after session? And it took me a while to realize I was always sitting with my teeth, rind teeth. Um, or if you kind of, you, you somehow you kind of sneak yourself through moving, um, you make it maybe until the end of the session with only so much pain, but you feel not good about yourself afterwards. So what can you do without hurting yourself and fighting and without fleeing from the pain and what I usually tell people now is well if you feel like you're dying on the third day there's no reason to worry because we still have space in the graveyard for you um, just die and I will bury you in the graveyard later. And of course nobody wants to die. But uh, the fact is, unless you sit there with a kind of attitude that, well, even if it costs my life, I'm just going to sit here. Um, I think it's hard to make it through a five-day session without either biting yourself through or fleeing from the pain and, and kind of somehow trying to sneak through. Um, at one point, you, you just have to accept your situation even if it feels like you're burning in hell. And when you do that, then it becomes very easy. Because you don't have to fight anymore. And you don't have to escape anymore. And it might still hurt, but you might realize, oh, but I'm still sitting here. So when you ask about this practical, impractical thing, and you're not sure, is that what I'm doing here still practical, or am I still already in the area of the impractical? Sometimes it feels that what you're doing is, is way over the top. But... If you're following the Sangha here at Antaiji, probably, probably you're, you're on the right track, I would say. I mean, that's why we have a Sangha, that's why we have a schedule. Um,
and sometimes it's for sometimes for some people the zazen is the hardest part of it for some people summer is the harder part of it for some people the winter study period is very hard when it's cold and lonely but hmm. During the last 16 years, at least, I've seen nobody die here. So it's sort of practical, I would say, as long as you keep to the schedule. Or as I said yesterday, I think uh, there's been even people getting up at 2 in the morning here to, to study Japanese before the Zen. And, and even these people survived. Even these people survived. So... Um, I think you don't have to worry too much that that your practice is going to get in very impractical here, Dan Taiji. And if it does, then probably, hopefully, people will warn you about it and say, hey, hey, relax, you're doing too much. But at least from my experience, in most cases, it was kind of the opposite. I felt like, oh, maybe I should relax a little bit. And somebody tells me, no, 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 no. It's too early for you to relax. <laughs> somebody gives you some extra ta task on a free day. And, and somebody has some, some job for you to do when you rather feel like you would relax. So. But, yeah, in case you really do too much, uh, probably, probably the people around you will notice and tell you, hey, Take a break. No other questions? Yes, please. I have a question. It's about this. Uh situation of like staying in the capital where mm -hmm. you first was or moving to the countryside. I remember reading in the Bendawa, he says he sort of takes on the heavy burden of mm. saving all living beings, but at the same time he refuses to go to the capital for a while, even mm. though that could give him more followers and potentially save more people. Where, what's your sort of perspective on that? Well, that sentence uh, is usually, or there's two different, completely opposite uh, readings of that sentence. Uh, the one that's closer to what you just said is that uh, he came back from China. He has the aspiration to save all living beings. So in the case of Dogen at the time, would be all Japanese people at the time that haven't heard of the Buddha Dharma yet. But he feels it's too early for him right now at age 28 having just come back from china so he needs some time for himself to maybe anchor his practice focus on his own practice before he starts building his own monastery um, so he could have uh, meant that um, i want to in a couple of years uh, start some sangha of my own, like Hoshoji, you already have the plan is in his head, but it's too early for me now. All I can do right now is write the Bendova, and for those of you who want to know about Zazen, please read this, while I uh, do my solitary practice in Fukaksa. Uh, the other reading um, would be I don't have the, the original Japanese here right now, but um, it's basically that he's saying something like, I'm going to get that off my shoulders now. I like, I, I have this task that I want to save all living beings. I'm going to get that off my shoulders. And the first interpretation is getting that off his shoulders says he will, he forgets about that for the time being. Maybe he's going to shoulder it later. The other interpretation is getting it off the shoulders means that I'm going to do it right now. I'm already doing the first step and uh, writing the bendova is the start of it. And uh, in Fukaksa, he didn't have a sangha at the time, but he was meeting people. And Ko and Ejo, his first disciple, first met him there. So uh, rather than saying, I'm going to postpone it 
And for the time I'm going to give you the bendo while so you've got something to read already, he's saying, well, I'm getting that off my shoulders. And getting it off the shoulders means I'm going to do it right now. Uh, uh, maybe I don't reach so many people at first, but I mean, whoever wants to see me can see me here in the Hermitage, and later maybe I'm going to do something else. So there's these two different uh, interpretations. I personally prefer the second one, uh, but some say, well, if you look at the original Japanese, uh, you can only read it the first way. So he said, it's too early for me now, I'm going to do it later. Anything else? Ta hoka ni na keleba o wali masho. Shujo muhen seigando. Oh. 